Hi, I'm Eric Siegel with Eric'sTrains.com. You know, most of the time I review high-end O-scale engines, which can be quite expensive, but today we're going to be taking a look at something that is much more affordable. Now, this is not a scale model, but it is nonetheless a high-quality product that is specifically geared for the budget-minded O-gauge beginner. This is a Lion Chief Plus New York Central Mikado from Lionel. So here we have an engine that I would not normally buy because as I said, I usually buy high-end O-scale stuff, but I was given an opportunity to get a sample of one of these and so I figured why not review it. And I'm glad I did because this is a really, really nice engine. Now again, it's not to scale or anything like that. So if you're looking for high-end, you're looking in the wrong place, but that's not the target market here. This is targeted, I think, towards the beginner or the budget-minded hobbyist, or it could also be marketed toward older hobbyists who may want to get something new, but might be a little intimidated by legacy and TMCC and DCS and all that stuff. So here we have a nice entry-level engine that is packed full of quality and a lot of fun to run. Anyway, before we get too deep into this review, let's go over a little bit of history on the prototype. The Mikado had a 282 wheel arrangement. That means there were two wheels on the lead truck, eight drive wheels here in the middle, and then two wheels on the trailing truck, so 282. The 282 wheel arrangement became incredibly popular in railroading all over the world, and especially here in the U.S. The very first 282 type steam engine was built in 1884, and at that time they were originally called Calumets in reference to the first railroad to use them, which was the Chicago and Calumet Terminal Railway. Of course, the name did not stick because today we call them Mikados and not Calumets. So why do we call them Mikados? Well, around 1897, Baldwin Locomotive Works began building a series of 282 engines for the Nippon Railway of Japan. And because of their early use on Japanese railways, they became known as Mikados, and the name stuck. Of course, having a Japanese-sounding name like Mikado became a bit awkward after the Japanese bomb Pearl Harbor in 1941. So for a time, during and after the war, they became known as MacArthur's to sound more American. But of course, that didn't last, and today, most rail fans call them Mikados or Mikes. Now, as I said, the Mikados would eventually become extremely popular here in the States. That trend started in the 1920s when the Mikados began to replace the 280 consolidations. And eventually over 14,000 Mikados would be used for American railroading. Virtually every railroad in America used Mikados at some point. The New York Central, which is what we have here, was the largest user of Mikados with 715 units. Mikados were also popular in other countries around the world, so to say that the Mikado was one of the workhorses of the steam era would be a massive understatement. These things were everywhere. There were two types of Mikados made here in America, the light Mikado and the heavy Mikado. The main difference between the two was that the heavy Mikados were built to a higher axle load. They had larger cylinders and a much larger boiler for increased steam generating ability. Now, I am not an expert on the visual differences between the two, and Lionel did not specify which type this is modeled after but I'm gonna take a guess and say it's modeled after a light Mikado, and I'm only saying that because of the relatively small cylinders and the thin boiler, but I could be wrong. But on the other hand, it really doesn't matter because when we're talking about semi-scale O27 trains like we have here, Attention to detail is not the most important thing. It really doesn't matter what they got right or wrong in terms of being prototypical. What's important is having a well-built model that is a lot of fun to run, and that is exactly what we have here. All right, so now that you've got a little bit of history on the real Mikados, let's get back to the Lion Chief Plus Mikado that we have here. We'll get started with some stats and facts, and we'll also start to delve into the Lion Chief Plus system and everything it has to offer. 
So the combined length of the engine and the tender is right at 18 inches. It's about 19 inches if you count the couplers. The engine weighs four pounds, four ounces. The tender weighs two pounds, two ounces. So that gives us a combined weight of six pounds, six ounces, which is pretty darn good for something that I would consider an entry level product. You know, historically when Lionel has put out entry level engines, they've had a lot of plastic on them and they've been kind of light weight and flimsy. That's not the case here. We have a die cast metal engine, a die cast metal tender, and die cast metal trucks. So from beginning to end, this is a solid engine. It's got a nice weight to it when you pick it up. And more importantly, it feels like a good solid model. The pulling power of this engine is right at one pound nine ounces, which is pretty good. And as far as the minimum required curve goes, Lionel does not specify a minimum curve on the box or in the instructions. And so I take that to mean that you can run this on pretty much any size curve you want all the way down to 027, which would make sense because this is about the size of a post-war style Lionel engine. And as we all know, you can run those engines on pretty much anything. On the inside of the engine is where things get interesting. Of course, we have a flywheel motor and a fan-driven smoke unit, but then we have the Lionel Line Chief Plus system, which also includes the Rail Sounds RC sound system. Now, as I hinted at earlier, the Lion Chief Plus system is sort of an entry-level way to get people introduced to the hobby in a way that's fun, that gives them a lot of features, it introduces them to remote control of their trains, and yet it does it in a way that won't break the bank and also doesn't require a big learning curve like you would need with something like Legacy. And so in that aspect, it succeeds. It's a whole lot of fun and it's easy to use. It's basically idiot proof. And yet at the same time, it's flexible enough to accommodate the needs of different types of hobbyists. So when you buy one of these engines, included in the box will be a Lion Chief Plus remote like you see here. And as you can see, each remote is coded for a specific engine. So this remote will only control New York Central number 1548. So if you were to buy five different Lion Chief Plus engines, you would have five different remotes, which could get a little cumbersome. And so for that reason, Lionel recently released a universal remote that will control up to three of these Lion Chief Plus engines with one remote. But right out of the box, you get your own remote. And as you can see, it's very simple. We'll go over the operation of it later but it couldn't be any easier to use one of these things. Now, along with the remote control, you also get the Rail Sounds RC sound package, which is sort of a truncated Rail Sounds package. You get a decent chuffing sound, an okay sounding whistle, a pretty good sounding bell, and also some nice crew talk sounds. It's not as nice as the full Rail Sounds package you would get with a legacy equipped engine, but it's pretty good, especially for an entry level product. Now, as I said, these engines are very flexible. The Line Chief Plus system can accommodate different styles of hobbyists. So if you want to use the remote control and have the sound package going, you can do that. But if you want to go old school and run this thing conventionally with no sounds at all, you can do that as well. Or any combination, you can run it conventionally and still have the sounds or you can run it conventionally with no sounds, you can run it with the Line Chief Plus remote and have no sounds, or you can have the sounds on. So whatever style of running you wanna do, you can do it with this Lion Chief Plus system. It's pretty cool. Now, just to clarify, the Lion Chief Plus system is completely self-contained. It's all in this one remote. You do not need a command base or any other extra hardware like you do with Legacy or TMCC or anything like that. It's all one unit and it works differently than TMCC and Legacy. TMCC and Legacy work by sending a radio signal through your rails to the engine. So the signal goes from your remote control to the command base out to the rails and into the engine. With Lion Chief Plus, it's more direct. This is a radio transmitter and it transmits directly to the engine which receives the signals and that's pretty much all there is to it. So just like we have RC cars and RC planes on the market, well this is an RC train. 
Now, because the Lion Chief Plus system is self-contained, that makes it easy to answer any compatibility questions. So for example, how many Lion Chief Plus engines can you run on your layout at the same time? Well, because each engine has its own individual remote, you can run as many as you want and there'll be absolutely no problem. The only situation I can imagine where it might get a little weird is if for some strange reason, and I don't know why you would do this, if you had two identical engines, so for example, if I had two of these New York Central 1548s on my layout, both of them would respond to the same remote. But other than that, as long as every engine is different and unique, you can run as many as you want. Ah, but what if you have a layout that already has Legacy or TMCC or DCS or all of the above? Well, again, because the Lion Chief Plus system is self-contained, it doesn't matter. All this engine cares about is its own remote. It doesn't care what other control systems are on the layout. So for example, right now on my layout, I've got some legacy engines, I've got some DCS engines, and it doesn't matter. I can run this Lion Chief Plus engine right alongside those. Now on the topic of TMCC and legacy, my sole criticism of these Lion Chief Plus products is that they are not legacy compatible. So while you can run them on a layout that has legacy on it and you can run them alongside legacy equipped engines, you cannot control these engines with the legacy system. And you know, at first I was quite critical of that. I thought, geez, why not? Just, you know, why not make it legacy compatible while you're at it? But over time, I've come to understand that Lionel did that for a specific reason. And the reason is this. Someone like me who has an established layout with legacy and DCS and whatnot, I'm not really the target market for these engines. Yes, I like it. Yes, I can run it on my legacy layout. But I'm not the target market. The target market is people who are just getting into the hobby or people who are looking to get their feet wet with remote control. And so from that point of view, I can understand why they left the legacy compatibility off. It would have probably increased production costs and therefore increased the retail prices of these things. And so while in a perfect world, I would like for them to be legacy compatible, I can understand why Lionel chose to not have it on there. So long story short, while you can run an engine like this on a legacy equipped layout like mine, you still have to control the engine with the Lion Chief Plus remote. There are no alternatives, unless of course you choose to operate the engine conventionally. Anyway, as we go in for a closer look at this engine, keep in mind that basic is the key word. You're not gonna find any super fancy detailing on this thing, but on the front here, here we've got our pilot, which is nicely detailed. I mean, it's all cast in, but it's okay. And then we've got some metal handrails up here. We've got a nice looking boiler front with a couple number plates and an operating headlight in the middle. We've got some marker lights up here, but they are non-operating. They just have some nice green jewels in there. Looking at the side of the engine, things look pretty good. We've got some nice looking drive gear and some really nice spoke drivers. There's some separately applied detailing going on, but most of the detailing is cast into the boiler. We've got some legible builder's plates over here, which is nice. And then we've got this metal handrail going all the way down the side, and there's one on the other side as well. Toward the back, the rear truck and the firebox area look pretty good. Up on the cab, we've got clear plastic inserts in the windows. On the inside of the cab, there are two hand-painted crew figures. The back head is modestly detailed, it's nothing special. However, there is a red glow in the firebox when the engine is in operation, which is a really nice feature, especially for an entry-level engine. Up on top we've got the smokestack and there is a fan driven smoke unit down in there and as always to load smoke fluid into the smoke unit all you have to do is pour the smoke fluid directly down the stack. Behind that we've got a nice looking sand dome and then we've got a little brass bell that actually does swing back and forth like that. Back behind that we've got a steam dome with a little brass whistle and some pop off valves. There's a little dynamo unit back here and some nice detailing. And then on top of the roof, we've got some cast-in details, including two roof vents. The roof vents do not open, they're just cast in. Here's a look at the back of the engine. And with this light, we can see the interior of the cab. And like I said, it's very modestly decorated. But 
it does have that red glow in the firebox which is really cool now there are some control switches here which we'll go over in just a second and then there's also a draw bar down here which we're also going to take a closer look at so I've put the engine in a cradle so that we can better see the interior of the cab and talk about these three control switches. Each of these switches is labeled, although you probably can't see what's written on top of this switch and this one over here in this corner. So over here we have the smoke unit switch and that turns the smoke unit on and off. Right here, this switch is labeled chuff. That turns the chuffing sounds on and off. So in the on position, while the engine's running, you'll hear the chuffing sounds, and you can blow the whistle and sound the bell and activate the crew talk sounds. If you turn it off, the engine will run silently, so there's no chuffing sound. However, you can still activate the whistle, the bell, and the crew talk sounds if you so desire. Finally, this switch in the middle, on one side, is remote, the other is transformer. In the remote setting, you run the engine with the Lion Chief Plus remote. In the transformer mode, it's conventional and you run it with just a plain old transformer. Okay, the next thing I wanna talk about is the drawbar system on these Lion Chief Plus steam engines because it is really, really well thought out. You know, when I first got this engine, I figured, okay, this is the drawbar they're using, big deal. But as I've continued to run this engine over and over within the last couple months, and I've gotten more experience with running this engine, I've really acquired an appreciation for this drawbar system they have here because it is so simple. It's so easy to use. Even a baby could do it. And it's so much easier than an annoying tether or a wireless drawbar or even an infrared tether. It's practically idiot proof. I mean, there's really no way you can mess it up unless you intentionally try to mess it up. So just like any other drawbar, it's shaped like an L. And at the end of the L move it over a little bit there are these grooves and inside each groove is a metal contact so we have four metal contacts and this whole section is going to slide into a receiving socket on the tender so let's take a look at that so here on the tender is the receiving socket for that draw bar and as you can see there are four metal contacts in here as well that correspond to the metal contacts coming from the engine so when it comes time to connect the engine and the tender, all you do is just lift up slightly on the engine, roll the tender up underneath, and drop that draw bar into the socket, like that, and then come in with your finger or a screwdriver or what have you, pop it down, and bam, that's all there is to it. It is so simple, and you know how many times I've had problems with this draw bar system over the last couple months? Zero. Now that we've made our way to the tender, here's a look at the front of the tender. And again, most of the detailing is cast in, including these steps down here. But we do have a couple of separately applied metal grab irons, one on each corner. Here we've got the back of the tender. We've got some legible signage in the middle, a cast in ladder, a couple of separately applied grab irons. And then down here is an electrocoupler. And yes, it can be thrown from the Lion Chief Plus remote. Here's a look at the top of the tender. Again, it's nothing fancy. We've got a cast in load of coal, but it should be noted that the coal load is metal. It's not plastic. So again, even though this engine is simplified, it still has an air of quality to it. And then back here, we've got a cast in hatch, which does not open. Here's a quick look at the underside of the engine. We've got a couple of pickup rollers here in the middle, and then we've got two traction tires on the last set of drivers. Finally, here's a quick look at the underside of the tender. Now, there are no pickup rollers on the tender because the tender draws its power from the engine via that drawbar system that I showed you earlier. So the only real thing to show you down here is the speaker for the Rail Sounds RC sound system. All right, the last thing we're gonna do before we power this thing up and start having some fun with it is BFIMO, best feature in my opinion. So the best feature, in my opinion, is actually not on the engine itself. It's the Lion Chief Plus remote. This thing is just a whole lot of fun. It's got a great design to it. I mean, look at this. The throttle wheel is designed to look like a drive wheel on a steam engine. How cool is that? 
it's easy to use, and it really makes model railroading fun. And that's what this hobby is all about. And for me, it's really significant because, you know, when you've been in this hobby for years and years and years, you still have fun running the trains. It's always fun. But the times when you get that childlike smile on your face become more and more rare. And so you really take note when it happens, and it happened with this remote. When I took this thing out of the box and started running the engine with the Lion Chief Plus remote, I got a smile on my face from ear to ear. I felt like I was a kid all over again, and that's really special. So the best feature, in my opinion, is the Lion Chief Plus remote. Well done. Okay, we've got the engine on the track, but we don't have power yet. I'm going to go ahead and power up the layout, and when I do that, you're going to hear a beeping tone coming from the Lion Chief Plus engine. I'll explain what that's about in just a second, but let me go ahead and flip the switch to power up the layout. All right, we've got power, and there is the beeping tone. That beeping tone is an error message. It means that for whatever reason, the Lion Chief Plus engine is not receiving a radio signal from the Lion Chief Plus remote. Now, that can happen for a variety of reasons. It might mean the remote is out of range. It might mean the batteries are dead. It might mean there's interference of some sort, but in this case, it's very simple. It means that the remote is not turned on yet. There's an on-off switch here on the side, so let's go ahead and turn it on. The light's on, and the engine is good to go. So anytime you hear that beeping tone, it means that the engine is not getting a signal from the remote. Most of the time, it's because the remote is not turned on. But like I said, it could mean there's interference, it could mean it's out of range, or it could just mean the batteries are dead. Now, the downside of that tone is that it means that anytime your layout is powered up and you have a Lion Chief Plus engine on the layout, you have to have the remote turned on. Even if you're not running the engine at that time, you still have to have the remote powered up or else you'll get that beeping tone. Okay, now that we're powered up, let's go ahead and have some fun with the Lion Chief Plus remote, starting with the whistle. That's activated by pressing the whistle button right here. Now let's check out the bell, which is activated by pressing the bell button. We can also fire the couplers on these engines via the remote with these two buttons. Now of course, this steam engine does not have a front coupler, but we do have a rear coupler, and that's activated by pressing this button twice quickly, like this. And that fired the rear coupler. And then here in the middle is the crew talk button. If we press it, we will hear some crew talk sounds. Now, depending on how long the engine has been running or how long it's been standing still, you will get different crew talk sounds. But let's check it out. Pretty cool. One thing that I didn't know about the Lion Chief Plus engines until I read the directions, which by the way is something you should always do, is that you can actually adjust the volume level using the Lion Chief Plus remote. To do it, what you do is you press the bell and whistle buttons simultaneously and hold them down. And when the LED there begins to flash, you're in volume adjustment mode. And with these buttons still held down, you turn the volume to where you want it. Then, when you've got it where you want it, release the two buttons, but then quickly turn the throttle back to zero or else the engine will speed off. And there we go. And that's how you adjust the volume on a Lion Chief Plus engine. The last thing I want to go over is speed control using the throttle wheel. It's very simple. When it's straight up and down like it is now, we're in neutral. The engine's not going anywhere. If we scroll clockwise, we'll go forward. If we scroll counterclockwise, we'll go backwards. That's all there is to it. So let me show you. 
I'll notch it in forward. And by the way, take note of the low speed performance of this engine. It is excellent. It's comparable to a legacy engine, actually. There we go. Look at that low speed. That's awesome. Now, the further you go clockwise, the faster it will go, and these things will go incredibly fast if you want. So let's go back to neutral. And now we'll notch it into reverse. And there we go. And again, that low speed performance is incredible, especially considering that this is an entry level product. There we go. Couldn't be easier. Okay, we're ready to move it out. Now, this little engine is a pretty darn good puller, especially for something that I would consider an entry-level product. So to show that off a bit, I've got 20 cars behind this engine. I'm sure it could pull more. I have not tested the upper limit of how many cars it can pull, but if it can pull 20 cars, that should be good enough for just about any layout.
right, that was a lot of fun. I hope you enjoyed it. And you know what? Because this is a semi-scale engine, I was actually able to break out a lot of my 027 rolling stock that doesn't get very much runtime on the layout these days. So that was a lot of fun. And included in that rolling stock, there was a lot of new stuff. There was some post-war stuff, some of it that my dad had when he was a kid. And also included in there was the very first train item that I ever bought with my own money. It's a boxcar, and I bought it when I was about 13 years old. I won't tell you which boxcar it is, you'll just have to guess. But at any rate, if you want to buy one of these engines, the retail price is $429.99. And of course, if you go through a good Lionel dealer, you can probably get a decent discount off that retail price. And as always, if you're looking for a good Lionel dealer, try my favorite train store, which is Legacy Station. You can find them on the web at www.legacystation.com or give them a call at 770-339-7780. Anyway, that's it for now. I'm Eric Siegel, and I'll see you next time. To discuss this model or any other O-Gage trains and to meet other O-Gage modelers, check out the O-Gage Railroading Magazine online forum at ogrforum.ogagerr.com.